Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren, Jesus Christ is King. Welcome to the Meaning of Catholic. This is Timothy Flanders. This is a continuation of our series on the Holy Scriptures, based on my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics. We're going through the Book of Acts, talking about the League of Christendom, which is the cultural force within the church militant, which announces and executes the reign of Logos incarnate. So this is the cultural commentary that we're trying to bring out of the Holy Scriptures, observing based on natural law precepts and what we find in the Holy Scriptures. So, first of all, the meaning of Catholic is an apostolate dedicated to uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church by means of truth and charity. So I want to thank all of the patrons for supporting this effort. If you have been benefited from this apostolate, please support us financially, prayerfully. You can follow the link below, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. If you become a patron, you get the book for free. You get uh, other books for free, depending on your tier. You also get patron-only shows. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. is a patron-only show. So patrons, make sure that you... Uh, show up for that if you can, or send me any questions. We can talk about it uh, at, at that show tomorrow. So just a reminder for patrons. So thanks for all your support. Thanks for watching. Let's get into the text. So we've talked last time. It was two weeks ago since we last talked, but it was the formation of the League of Christendom. The League of Christendom is the alliance among the elders in Christian culture to form a judgment against the conspiracy of Antichrist. The conspiracy of Antichrist are these various forces uniting against the church to prevent the reign of Logos incarnate in society and in their souls, in their souls and in their society. The society is the king, the coin, and the kitchen, which is the government, the economy, and the family, and all of it springs from the soul of man. So the conspiracy of Antichrist unites to prevent the reign of Logos incarnate because they're attached to earthly things, they're attached to the earth. And the League of Christendom unites among the elders of Christian culture, the elders being the apostles, the bishops, the pope, later on the ecumenical councils, they unite against the conspiracy of Antichrist. And the difference is that they form a judgment. They form the League of Christendom in order to proclaim in a new way the same Logos. They proclaim in a new way the same Logos, and that is what we call extraordinary development of doctrine. This is the Council of Nicaea. This is the Council of Constantinople. This is the Council of Florence, the Council of Vatican, one or two. Now, the extraordinary development of doctrine sets the League apart from the conspiracy, because the conspiracy only unites under the principle of not Christ. They unite under a principle of negation. They cannot among themselves agree on what is true, because they don't, don't care about truth. They care about voluntarism. They care about imposing their will on their own souls and society. That's all they care about. That's why they, when they gain power, they self-destruct in a contest of power. But the League of Christendom, as we saw in Acts chapter 15, the League of Christendom is a contest of humility, where the, the text says in chapter 15 that there was much debate. But they united, and they came to a conclusion, they, came, they made a judgment about the disputed matter of that time, which was the heresy of Judaizing. The heresy of Judaizing was that the cultus of Moses, the cultus of Moses was efficacious for the atonement, this, the atonement of the blood, atonement, the salvation of your souls. The Pharisaical party within the church was teaching that you needed to be circumcised 
and follow the all of the mitzvot of the Mosaic cultists in order to have salvation. But the establishment of the League of Christendom in Acts chapter 15 makes a judgment that the right, the cultus, which establishes the Christian culture is the right of baptism, not the right of circumcision. And this is something that St. Peter first did of his own authority, adjudicating the Mosaic law in the case of Cornelius and his household. So this was an action, a unilateral action of the Pope, St. Peter, without cons- consultation with the rest of the church, by a direct revelation from God to adjudicate the Mosaic law and baptize Cornelius, who was a full-blooded Gentile of the Roman legion. So all of this has come to pass. Now we ch- come to Acts chapter 16. There's some very, very interesting things that happen, and we're going to spend a lot of time just on one single verse. But before we get to that verse, Acts chapter 16, so what happens is they make this judgment, and they claim the authority based on the Holy Spirit to adjudicate the Mosaic Law. And this is going to be a crucial difference between the church, on the one hand, and rabbinical Judaism, which is created in a few decades after this. So we'll talk about that in a second. So first, chapter 16, verse uh, verse 1, we'll just start at the beginning. So, he, St. Paul, came also to Derby and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to co- accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, here's an interesting passage because St. Paul, having already received the judgment that the circumcision is not the cultus, into which the Christian culture, uh, you, you are initiated into Christian culture, he then circumcises Timothy, who is born of a Jewish woman. Now, according to Halakha, the, the rabbis at the time and later in the Talmud, being born of a Jewish mother makes you Jewish. That is, that is what makes you Jewish. It doesn't matter who your father was. It's, it's matrilineal. So Timothy is a Jew. He's not a Gentile, even though his father is a Greek. So he is a Jew. Now, St. Paul, nevertheless, he circumcises him to avoid scandal for the sake of the gospel, because he is trying to teach the Jews of that time that the Messiah is coming not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And St. Paul is not teaching a libertinism where we should just revoke all the law. We, we talked on Wednesday about the false Messiah um, what was his name, Chevy or Zevi? I can't remember. Uh, I believe it's Zevi, the false messiah. And his doctrine in the 17th century was breaking the law of Moses. And this is, this is the false messiah. And so St. Paul is teaching the Jews, preaching the gospel, that the messiah is coming not to revoke and destroy the law. This is what our Lord says. He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, here comes the, the key verse in this whole chapter. It's verse 4. Now, I'm going to read and compare. This is going to be, we're going to go into the important things in this, in um, chapter uh, 9 of my book. I mentioned this verse, and we go into the text, and we're going to talk about the text in Latin and Greek and why it's important. So, first, I'm going to read from the Dewey Reams version which is the best translation all around in so many different ways. But in this particular way, we're going to see why it excels. So 16 verse, somebody in the chat says Zevi. Yeah, Zevi is the false messiah in the 17th century. Um, So 16 verse 4, And they passed through the cities and then delivered unto them the decrees for to keep that were decreed by the apostles and priests who were at Jerusalem. Okay, so the RSV says this, they went on their way through the cities, delivered to them for observance the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem. The RSV fails in this case because there are three key words here. First of all, the first 
word that we're going to go at is para didosan, which means they traditioned to them. It is not translatable into English. It is a verb form of tradition. Tradition in English is only a noun, but in Greek and Latin, it is also a verb. And in this case, it's a verb form of tradition. So they traditioned to them, is what the text says. Now, what, see what's happening here. The church has already been born, and all they have is the Old Testament written. They have the oral tradition as given by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then they have the decision of the church. Now, the decision of the church is traditioned to them. Now, there's no New Testament. New Testament doesn't exist yet. The New Testament does not exist. It's all, the church only exists with the Old Testament, the decision of the church, the oral tradition, which is then passed down. It is traditioned to them. It is the oral tradition. So we have the whole church here before the New Testament is even written. This is why the Protestant notion of sola scriptura is completely bankrupt from the very scriptures themselves. They're traditioning to them the oral tradition and the decision of the church, the judgment that has been made. Now, making judgment is a fulfillment of the Mosaic law because the Mosaic law provided judges to judge cases. And this is going to be the key difference between Roman Catholicism and rabbinic Judaism on the one hand, and then all of the other uh, Christian sects, whether that's Protestant or Orthodox. None of them can do this. One of, none of them can do what the church did in Acts chapter 16, verse 4. So first of all, they tradition to them. Now, all the, all the, everybody can tradition. The Jews do it, the Protestants do it, and the Orthodox all do it. They all tradition. They all pass something down. But here's the difference. The next words are, they traditioned to them to keep phulasin, which is to obey. But here's the key Greek word, ta dogmata, ta kekrimena, which is translated in Latin as dogmata que erant decreta. The dogmas decreed. So this is what the text actually says, is that they tradition to them the dogmas that were decreed for them to obey. Now, the Dewey Reams is the only translation that really brings out this sense. The RSV says the decisions that were delivered to them for observance, which is very soft. The term dogmata and decreta in Latin and Greek already existed at that time as Roman legal terms. This is Roman legal language. This is when the Roman law was being decreed for observance to bind all the Roman citizens to obey. This is the term that's being used here. Dogmata decreta. So we have the church decreeing dogma as binding on the faithful. So they're making a judgment. Now this is, this is a fulfillment of the Mosaic law. Exodus chapter 18, verse 25. And choosing able men out of all Israel, Moses appointed them rulers of the people, rulers over thousands and over hundreds and over fifties and over tens, and they judged the people at all times, and whatsoever was of greater difficulty, they referred to Moses, and they judged the easier cases only. And, and if you read the law of Moses, it also includes the priesthood later on, when the priest is making judgments about particular matters, like, for example, the uh, lep if someone's someone's cured of leprosy. Our Lord sends the, the leper that he's cured back to the priest to be judged by the priest because that's his place is to judge. So being able to make a judgment to decree a dogma in the Roman legal custom of decreeing a dogma to observe, to obey, you're decreeing a binding law based on the authority to judge. This is what is contained in the Mosaic law, which is fulfilled in the church. And it's fulfilled only in the Roman Catholic Church because only the Roman Catholic Church claims the authority to judge something and make it binding on the whole church. And this is what the church does in Acts chapter 15, 16, verse 4. The Jews cannot do it. The Protestants cannot do it. Certainly not the Protestants. And the Orthodox try to do it, but they can't because they don't have Rome. And this is what makes the difference. This is the, the power of the church already in the Acts chapter 16, verse 4 is being able to decree something binding on all the faithful. They're, they're going through all the cities and delivering the dogmas for them to obey. 
This is not a discussion. The, the authority is there. They've claimed the authority from God, from Jesus Christ, the new Moses, who is the lawgiver. According to the prophecy in Deuteronomy, there will come another prophet like me, says Moses, like me, meaning a lawgiver who gives law binding on the, on the whole world, on the people of God. The church then claims the authority to adjudicate the Mosaic law and make it binding on all the faithful. So we're going to talk later on when, when the, the temple is destroyed, the Pharisaical party will take over the Jews and they will claim the authority, but not based on God, but based on something that they call the oral Torah. They will assert that they have the authority to adjudicate the Mosaic law, but the problem is they all disagree on all the different mitzvot of the Mosaic law. They disagree on these things. There's majority opinions and there's minority opinions, and there's different things that go on throughout the history of rabbinic Judaism. And it's essentially a debate about all sorts of different commandments of the Mosaic law. Now, there's certain agreements on certain things, and there's certain disagreements on other things. But there's no authoritative binding judgment as there was in the Mosaic law itself in Exodus chapters 18. There's no way for that Mosaic law to be fulfilled because there's not authoritative judges except in the church. The church claims that authority, and this is what makes the difference between all the other bodies of Christianity and Judaism. And for that matter, the Mohammedans can't do it either. They do not have a binding authority either. They can't even, they've got different opinions about Sharia, and they don't have a way to adjudicate those either. They do not have the claimed authority from God to adjudicate these matters. So, this is what makes the Roman Catholic Church the true church. It's the only church that can do what the church did in 16.4 in Acts. So, that's why this is so important. And you see, when you look at the English translation, which, which, I, which I compare in my, in my book, you see the difference when, when you compare all these English translations, which soften all of these Roman legal terms. They soften them down so that they're just sort of decisions and, and they're much less a force of binding authority. So this is the key, is the authority of the League of Christendom, which has the authority to bind the church. So let's continue in chapter 16. What we have next is that in the book of Acts, you have the whole society being converted, but it starts with the families. Now in verse uh, 14, they go to the next city, and verse 14 says this, one who heard us, and now it's talking in the first person, meaning uh, St. Paul and his companions, so presumably St. Luke is among them. Verse 14, one of us heard, uh, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to listen to what St. Paul said, what Paul said, and when she was baptized with her whole household, she begged us saying, if you have judged me, the faithful of the Lord, come to my house and stay. So, her whole household is baptized. This is as it was with Cornelius. So the king, the queen, in the kitchen is the whole society. So the souls of men are being saved and they're being liberated from the power of Satan, brought over to the power of Christ. And this is happening through all whole households. And this is the mustard seed, which will ultimately conquer the Roman Empire, is the Christian families. So the authority of Christ the king within these families will eventually conquer the whole society. But it starts with the family. This is the mustard seed that we see in the book of Acts. Now, here in this chapter, we also see a conflict with the coin, the economy. This is when we come face to face with the fact that as our Lord found in the temple with the idolatry of avarice, the idolatry of money, the, the New Testament says that the love of money is the root of all evil, the avarice is idolatry. So it's a form of idolatry to love money. And in this case, we're talking about the melding of the idolatry of avarice with the idolatry of pagan idols. So verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by Susan. She followed Paul and us, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the ways of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul was annoyed, and turned and said to the Spirit, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her the very hour. Now watch what happens. 
they have power over the economy to use idolatry, to use divination, to make money. And what happens is this is what caused the, causes the mob violence of the conspiracy to coalesce against them because they realize they're losing power over the economy in order to worship the idols of money and Susan. Verse 19, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the mag- magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. Verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. So, the economy is threatened. They want a free economy, free of any rules, any moral order whatsoever. They want to be free in the economy. They want to be free from logos. This is what the modern liberals, when they say we want freedom, what they mean is they want freedom from Logos. They want freedom from the church. And these men want freedom in their economy to use demons to make money. And nothing much has changed. The billion-dollar porn industry wants freedom to have, quote-unquote, freedom of speech. That's what they call violence against women, that is pornography. It's really violence against women and children which promotes sex slavery. We don't want to give freedom to that economy. And yet, this is the same thing that St. Paul faced in this passage because he's not give, he doesn't want to give freedom to this economy to make money off of, off of this slave girl. She's enslaved with, and she's enslaved and oppressed by a demon. And she's being, the, his, her owners are making money off her. This is an exploitation of this poor girl and St. Paul frees her. He liberates her, the true liberation, the true freedom from Satan's power. But the, the, the owners want freedom from logos. That's what they want, which allows them to impose their will. It's voluntarism once again. So what happens? They throw them in, in prison. Then there's an earthquake, which comes from God which immediately converts the jailer. The jailer is about to kill himself because he's, he's failing in his task. But St. Paul says, St. Paul could have just run away, but instead he saves the jailer and he converts him and his whole household is baptized. Once again, the house, the kitchen, the family is being conquered by Jesus Christ, the King. So he baptizes them. Now watch what happens here. Verse 34, but when it was day, so they, St. Paul, there was an earthquake. He, he converted the jailer. He could have run away, but he just stayed there. When it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. Do they now cast us out secretly? No, Let them come themselves and take us out. Now, this refers to the fact that being a Roman citizen made you exempt from this violent abuse that he suffered. You could simply say, I'm a Roman citizen, and you could have, you would need to have due process and habeas corpus and that type of thing. You need to have uh, a judgment. You didn't have, you could go to the law courts. You couldn't just be beaten up like Paul just was with with the, the Roman officials. Now, notice, however, that he was beaten already. He could have stopped the beating way back when they started beating him. He said, well, he could have said, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. But he didn't because he loves suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. So he didn't even take out his trump card at that time. Now, when he takes out his trump card, he takes it out to avoid, and this is following Haydock's biblical commentary, is what he points out, is that he takes out his Roman citizenship in order to avoid, again, avoid scandal with the new converts. The new converts have been converted, and he he is thrown in prison as a criminal. And in order to avoid scandal, so that the new converts will continue to follow St. Paul so that they can follow Jesus Christ, he says, no, I'm a Roman citizen, which forces the Roman officials to exonerate St. Paul publicly. The police, verse 38, the police reported those words to the magistrates, and they were afraid 
when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. They took them out and asked them to leave the city. So St. Paul forces the Roman magistrates to humble themselves before him so that he can be exonerated for the sake of the gospel. So he loves suffering on the one hand. He accepts all the beatings for the name of Jesus Christ. And then he takes out his Roman citizenship so that the new converts that he's making with Lydia's household will not feel the scandal of being a criminal. He exonerates himself at the right time. Now, they ask him to leave the city, but because he's forced them to apologize, he refuses to leave the city and goes straight back to Lydia and visits Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they exhorted them and departed. So they they don't leave the city. They say, okay, we're going to take our time now. We go back to our, our converts that we just made. We'll strengthen them. And then when we're good and ready, we'll leave. So St. Paul really has them in his power. He's really working uh, the system to the advantage of the gospel. And we're going to see this later on in the book of Acts when our Lord Jesus Christ appears to St. Paul and says, you have martyred for me in Jerusalem. You will martyr for me in Rome. And that is when St. Paul uses his Roman citizenship in order to testify to the true king before Emperor Nero himself, who is the Mark of the Beast. All of that is coming. Stay tuned. It's going to be really exciting when we get into the book of Revelation, the Mark of the Beast, going into all that. It's really great history. It's very exciting. So we're going to continue on, and we're going to be continuing talking about uh, the formation of Judaism. As I said, rabbinic Judaism is, is a question of authority. Who has authority to adjudicate the Mosaic law. And the church says we have the authority by Jesus Christ, who is the new Moses. So we're going to be continuing to talk about Jews and Judaism and some of these factors that go through this. We are going to be starting a very special new series in a few weeks. Really excited for this. It's going to be talking about a very important history involving Freemasons and alchemists and all sorts of secret societies and their efforts to destroy the church. So that's a very important series that we'll get into in a few weeks. So stay tuned for that. Once again, please become a patron. Help support this apostolate. If you want this apostolate to grow and reach souls, please support us financially and prayerfully for the greater glory of God and the salvation of souls. So thanks for watching. We'll continue with the book of Acts. We'll continue with this series. And uh, as we go along, send me any questions. Happy to take a look at anything we can. So let's offer up a prayer for the judgment of the church, because we really need the judgment of the church at this time. We're in a situation, a crisis, where the judgment of the church has really been obscured by evil men who are in the church who don't want the church to make a judgment. But the church has authority to make an authoritative judgment and bind all the faithful using the charitable anathema, which is the anathema which binds all the faithful. This is what Vatican II refrained from doing. Dietrich von Hildebrand begged Paul VI to bind the faithful with an anathema. Paul VI refused to do that. And in my opinion, this is what we need. We need a binding decision from the church to bind on the faithful. We need the bishops to arise and make their judgment, make an authoritative judgment, which is their authority as princes of the church. So we pray for the judgment of the church, for the judgment of good bishops to make the judgment with their authority that they have from Jesus Christ. So let's offer up in our Father for that intention. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Pater nostra, qui es in cedi, sancti vegetu nomen tuum. Adveniat regnum tuum, fiat vantas tua, sicut in cedo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum danibus hodie, dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris. Et in nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nostra malo, Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.